delegates will be heard in the order they registered. When I call your name, you'll be unmuted and able to speak. And I do apologize in advance. I may, uh, in fact, I will get some of the pronunciations wrong, but uh, I'll do my best. Um, a reminder that each delegate has up to five minutes to address the board. Uh, but in addition, they can always write in any additional comments they would like to. We have a total of 41 delegates registered and four council delegates. Uh, the li list on the delegates on the agenda has been updated since last Wednesday, and I think there might have been another update, uh, may have been a cancellation this morning. Uh, just a reminder to board members, if you could please hold your questions and comments until after all of the delegates have spoken, unless you have a question specifically that relates specifically to one of the delegates and the comments they've made. So with that, um, and, and just so the public knows, uh, two things. One is, is that uh, only the, the, at the end, only the board members will be able to ask questions. And, uh, but also, we currently are not streaming live on YouTube. Uh, only our monthly board meetings are streamed. And I understand we have been getting some inquiries about that. And that certainly can be directed to the board for further discussion. So with that, I'll move on <clears throat> to the public delegations. And the first one on our list is Aaron Lee with Octiva. So if, uh, if um, Aaron's mic could be unmuted, then uh, we'll start with, with Aaron. Hi, does that work? Hi, yes, you're live. Great, thank you for the opportunity to join you. Where we spend money reflects what we care about and prioritize. Violence Against Women has been identified as a priority by increasing the number of VAW officers, better serving Indigenous and racialized women, and a commitment to hire a VAW liaison. These are positive investments. However, we want to ensure that they're ongoing and do not rely on budget increases. Almost 30% of calls to police across Canada are for domestic violence. If we look at the OPS budget, do we see 30% of resources dedicated to this? Responding to violence against women and gender-based violence is, on, is both chronic and ur urgent. It needs to be resourced as such. We don't need more money added to police budgets. We need money from existing budgets. This can be done by using transparent and participatory gender equity and inclusion budgeting. Beyond budget allocation, we need to evaluate service quality. Feminists have been advocating for 40 years to address failures in policing. Many are still at the table despite slow change. We hope these new investments will help substantively. If not, you'll hear from us. I will now address the proposed mental health response strategy. We need to reject the status quo. We need a community-based crisis response that is external to OPS. The parameters set by the response strategy and council uh, motion for public consultation will result in entrenching the status quo if we aren't decisive now. The strategy and motion are worded carefully to consult, but not to commit to a community-based crisis response, despite contrary verbal statements from OPS leadership. This is double speak. Consultation with inaction erodes trust. This is in stark contrast to Toronto. In June, City Council provided 36 police reform recommendations to the board. Subsequently, the Police Services Board incorporated feedback and input from numerous sources and adopted 81 police reform recommendations. Among them is for the city manager to develop alternative models to community safety response, including the creation of a non-police crisis response. As it stands, our chief has publicly challenged the viability of community-based models that are fully external to police. For example, he claimed the CAHOOTS program is only showing positive outcomes after 20 years. I spoke directly with CAHOOTS and like me, they would like to know on what basis this claim is being made. In handling over 24,000 calls annually, CAHOOTS has saved the city an annual estimated average of 8 million on public safety and 14 million for ambulance and emergency room treatment. In addition, there are two key measures of success I'd like to share. They demonstrate only greater effectiveness over time. One, in its entire 30 year history, no one in an escalated state has ever died because of interaction with, with CAHOOTS. And two, there has never been a serious injury with, to CAHOOTS staff in delivering service to patients. CAHOOTS isn't the only alternative, but it underscores the needs to review a range of community-based responses that are fully independent from police. Chief Lip Slowly has remarked that reallocating police resources is dangerous. He claims it will leave a gap in crisis response. The, the success of CAHOOTS contradicts this. What could be more dangerous than the deaths of Abdurrahman Abdi and Anthony Oust? The chief has also noted that CAHOOTS is, CAHOOTS is not funded from reallocation. This may be true, but is untenable in a global pandemic. Massive spending is necessary right now, but governments will eventually make cuts and reallocations. 
We urge the board to follow the lead of the Toronto Board and City Council. There, the city manager has been directed to, quote, detail the likely reductions to the Toronto Police Services budget that would result from these changes, end quote. The 4.5% budget increase OPS is to receive should be reserved for reallocation to deliver community-based crisis response that is fully independent from OPS. Finally, the parameter that alternative responses exclude violent or criminal situ situations is problematic. Relying on a narrow police de definition of violence and criminality contributed to the deaths of Abdurrahman Abdi and Anthony Oust. We propose adopting the city council and board language from Toronto of significant safety risk. To close, we need to stop consultation theater. Today, the public was invited to provide input on a fait accompli budget. We need open, transparent, and participatory budgeting for the police service, as will be introduced in Toronto. In the meantime, the board and police need to do what many organizations have to do when we're trying to solve a problem. Examine promising practices, look at the budget, and reallocate funds to achieve the best outcomes possible. Not doing so is dangerous for communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erin. Um, I certainly would have some comments, but I want to turn it to my fellow board members, uh, uh, Chair Deans um, uh, and uh, member, well, all, all of the members. So I'll start with Chair Deans. Do you have some questions or comments? Well, thank you for your comments, Erin, and uh, your thoughtful presentation. And, uh, you know, I... I am certainly as chair of the police board uh, interested in moving this yardstick a long way forward. Um, I don't know if all of us will always agree on exactly the right approach, but I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're suggesting in terms of following uh, Toronto's lead and you want to reallocate funds today or now in, in this period. And I'm just wondering where those funds would go, who, uh, in your opinion, is in a position in this city right now to take this lead? Who has the capacity currently to take on the mental health response? Well, I think what we have in Ottawa already is a very strong mental health um, set of services through the community health and resource centers. There's grassroots resources such as the Ottawa Street Medics. I think what we need to do though is challenge the idea that it's literally flipping a switch. Maybe it is six months, maybe it is a year where those resources are shifted to then build that response. But I think one of the things that we know is how large the police budget already is. And if we provide those resources, then the sooner we can get to the other outcome. Yeah, and, and I guess this is the whole essence for me. It's not, should we make a change? I agree with you that we need uh -huh. to make a change. It's who has 24 seven capacity to take it on. And right now I, I agree with you, it has to be built. And the question is how long would that take and how do we do it? Um, so that, those are all my comments, but thank you for your thoughtful presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Member Johnson. Yes, thank you. And thank you, Erin, for, for your comments and your presentation today. These are important issues. Um, in the new services detailed in, in the budget, uh, there is money forecasted for the sexual harassment project, de-escalation and gender-based analysis and training and mental health contracted services of, I believe, $852,000. I think, you know, in further to what Aaron's been saying, you know, we should look at that money carefully and perhaps add to the money for those new services. It's great to see these are included, but there also isn't any spending in future years. So I guess my question is really to note, to, to, to build on what Aaron has said and then, you know, make a specific uh, suggestion with the current budget. Uh, to be considered. Thank you, Member Johnson. Uh, are there any other um, board members that wish to, I'm not seeing any hands up. Um, so uh, in, in the absence of any other questions from any other board members, I wanted to say to thank you, Aaron. I think the chair, Chair Deans has made it very clear. 
uh, as has the chief, that, that this, this can't be business as usual. We have to make changes. I think as Member Johnson has said, we need to get a handle on the, the magnitude of the costs associated with it. What is that and where does it have to go to? As the chair has said, um, yes, we need to change the way we're doing it. And yes, that means reallocation of money. Um, we're at the sort of baby steps of it now. And I certainly hope that you'll be staying in touch and keeping our feet to the fire to make sure just that we have to be made are made. So thank you once again for, for coming, taking the time to speak to us. And um, I'll move on to number two on the list, which is Erica Eiffel. Eiffel. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, I guess I'll start then. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the third time now that I've come to speak here on behalf of the Coalition Against More Surveillance and other residents of Ottawa who want to see a major shift in how we address violence, harm, conflict, and other social issues in the city. While we're happy to see no indication that the Ottawa Police Force will invest in body cameras, worn body cameras in 2021, this buzzword budget still leaves us with plenty of concern. Your gross operating budget now sits at 376.4 million, representing 9.5% of the total 2021 budget for the city. A $13.2 million increase does not indicate change, despite Chief Slowly's claims that this is a business as, as different and better budget. You've deemed calls to defund the police dangerous and you've painted community-based organizing uh, organizations as incapable of managing funds. There are also observations of OPS increasing surveillance of community activists. More officers, more neighborhood resource teams, more training, none of this reflects what public delegates have come to this table and asked for over the past several months. We wonder if you've been listening. So what is the plan? Nothing within this budget or the PR around it tells us that the OPS is capable of moving forward with a plan that ensures community safety and well-being. You've, state, you've all stated quite clearly that the police don't want to be in the mental health business. So why does this police budget place you at the helm of a mental health strategy? What is the plan here? There does not seem to be one. There is no overall strategy. What we're seeing is tactics only. What specifically are the problems that you're trying to solve and what outcomes are you trying to achieve? These need to be identified at the outset and the resources match to these outcomes. What barriers to solving the problems have not yet been identified? These could include in internal barriers. How are the resources you're asking for going to be used to solve the aforementioned problems? That is not clear from the budget, from your communications, or from any publicly written statements. How will you ensure the residents of Ottawa, all of them, get value for money? It is the board's responsibility that the resources allocated are put towards solving these unidentified problems rather than to support the structure and system of policing writ large. There also doesn't seem to be an evaluation of how these resources are to be used and whether or not they're effective. If OPS cannot show the effectiveness through agreed upon metrics, then it cannot show that it needs the resources it asks for. You tell us we have to be patient, that change takes time, that we need to wait. We've been waiting and after all of this waiting, we don't seem to see a, str a strategy or plan. We've been waiting since 1991 when Vincent Gardner, a Jamaican immigrant, was shot and killed by Constable John Monette. We've been waiting since 1995 when Wayne Johnson, a black man, died from being pepper sprayed and chased by police to the Rideau River where he fell in and drowned. In the same year, Terry Norris, an indigenous man, was also pepper sprayed by police and died shortly after. We've been waiting since 2008 when Stacey Bonds, a black woman, was violently assaulted by three male officers and left half naked in a cell for hours. And of course, we've been waiting since 2016 when Abdirman Abdi was pepper spray beaten with a baton and punched by const repeatedly by Constable Daniel Monsion, who wore assault gloves. We're tired of waiting. We've waited. And Anthony Ost just died. 
Defunding the police is not irresponsible and dangerous. It is necessary, and the allocation of those resources necessary to be evaluated properly by police in order to serve the community it deems to protect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to, uh, I had a question for you, but uh, first I'll turn it over. Um, I don't see any hands up on my screen. Oh, I do. Uh, Member Nerman uh, had a question for you. Please proceed, LG. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair. And uh, thanks, Arika. What a wonderful, concise uh, presentation you have given. Uh, thanks for bringing those to our attention. Uh, in your comments, Arika, you have mentioned that uh, we have not been listening. Uh, do you have some specific uh, because this budget, I see, as uh, Peter slowly has stated, we have been trying, uh, we have been communicating. Uh, we means the board, and uh, and uh, in conjunction with the OPS, and we have been trying to take all the inputs from the community members and the groups. Do you have one or two specifics where you think that uh, we have not been listening? Well, I think a $13.2 million increase does not indicate any particular sort of listening. We have not yet set out of a true strategy to identify the problems. There's been no problem analysis being done. And that, um, that the OPS uh, either deems to solve we have not set out on outcomes. We don't really have a playing field that is understood by all and moving forward to address some of the issues within the OPS. I've seen nothing really, I mean, beyond, um, I would say, anti-racism training, which has been shown to really not work um, in police culture, we have not seen anything to deal with police culture itself. We have not even seen that as a problem. And I think to a lot of the residents in Ottawa, especially the ones in areas that are um, over police, that needs to be an open conversation. It's a problem. And if we don't identify it as a problem, and it's a problem that residents of those areas have constantly told the board. I mean, I've been here since the summer and we've heard, we've heard these stories. We've heard people give testimony to it. And yet uh, the answer is neighborhood resource teams with, which have been shown to be less than effective. And um, so that's a few instances, I think, that I can actually point to. And that's without doing any sort of deep dive in terms of um, you know, reports and such. Thank you, Erica. Uh, Member Nerman, does that, to, 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 was there anything else you, you, I think you expressed the will uh, of the board there. Was there anything else yeah. you wanted to add to that? Uh, uh, Chair Smallwood, will it be appropriate uh, to have the comments uh, on Erika's response by Chief Slowly? Well, I think what I'll do, if it's okay with everybody, is we'll go through all the presentations. Chief Slowly is going to make notes on it. And then at the end, uh, he'll have an opportunity to, to address some of the concerns because we may see a theme arising of, of some of these concerns. And this way, instead of doing it every single time, at the end, he can try to address, especially those that, are con that, that appear repeatedly throughout the presentations. Is that okay? That is reasonable. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Chair Deans. Uh, I believe you uh, you're having some technical issues, but you wanted I, to. I just can't find the raise hand button, but I think <laughs> there's so many uh, participants on the list. But uh, thank you for recognizing me nonetheless. Uh, and Erica, thank you for your presentation. And I wholeheartedly agree with you that this is about community safety and well-being. And I'm also the chair of Crime Prevention Ottawa, and I can tell you that we're the advisory uh, board to the community safety and well-being plan and I do think that community safety and well-being has to be at the very foundation of a critical 
change. Um, you talked about a need for a strategy and that you haven't seen one, and you are correct. You haven't seen one. Um, what police and the police board have been doing is resisting leading that strategy. We don't want to lead it. We recognize very much that it needs to be community led. And so with that in mind, there have been meetings um, happening. Uh, I can tell you that uh, the chief and I met with the city manager last week. We met with the medical officer of health. We met with Tony DeMonte, uh, who is um, uh, the head of emergency services at the city and is leading the community safety and well-being plan. And we have discussed with them uh, um, who rightfully in the community or in the city should be taking the lead in terms of a strategy. And uh, the point person at police on that is Deputy Chief Steve Bell. He will be reporting to the board at our December board meeting on a go forward plan for a wholesome public consultation and a strategy to move us in the direction that we believe the community wants to move. So uh, I guess I would say to you, uh, we're working very hard on that. We've heard loud and clear from the public the direction they want us to go and we're trying to respect those wishes. So thank you again for your presentation. Thank you, Chair Deans. Uh, and I see the Chief has uh, has decided he does want to weigh in at this time, so uh, uh, I'll let him weigh in. Although uh, the the idea was is that we not have the chief weigh in after every single pre presenter, but I think he has decided that this is very important that he must weigh in now. So, chief, over to you. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair Smallwood, and uh, only for this pro purpose. Um, um, I've heard quite a bit, um, not just on this call but other calls that. Uh, myself and the service are opposed to a non-police response to mental health and addictions. That is not the case. I suspect there will be other deputants who will want to say that, and it's entirely up to them if they do. Um, but I'll just put early on the record, we are very open to looking at non-police responses for a wide variety of calls for service that we currently do receive and do have to respond to because there isn't an alternative. What the only thing I've said is, and I think it's been echoed by Chair Deans, it's been echoed by uh, Octiva, that we need some time to put that plan in place and we can start small and grow as big as and as fast as possible, but simply to start tomorrow is not uh, doable. And I think we've heard that uh, in the discussions already. So to be clear, we are very open to and plan to be part of very constructive discussions about how to reduce uh, the overall response of uh, Ottawa police to mental health and addictions calls and to eliminate the response of Ottawa police in a wide variety of mental health and addictions calls as quickly and as safely as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. Um, and Erica, I, I just wanted to, th there was one comment you made and I, I just wanted to uh, mention that you mentioned that the OPS uh, increasing surveillance of community activists. And um, I, that is something that I think would be a concern to anybody and to, to get a sense that perhaps there was inappropriate or excessive surveillance going on. And I can, I, I can only assume that I speak on behalf of the board to say that that's not something that, that we would be in any way supportive of. The, the, the police play a very valuable role, but it shouldn't be just, uh, they shouldn't be there trying to suppress in any way, shape or form voices, community voices. So I can assure you that if you have specific examples or if you have concerns, please make sure that you, you do pass them on to the board because uh, that, that I think is something uh, that, that we would be very concerned about. So I'll remind the public again, we can only take qu questions from the board members. Uh, anybody who in the audience, uh, they have the ability to register and speak, uh, but we can't take uh, questions from the, the general public uh, through these presentations. So the next uh, person we have registered to speak is Maria Corcodina. Uh, I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, um, but Maria, it's um, you're up now. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. And did I get your name right? I hope. Yes, that's uh, Mara Corcodina. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Please, please go ahead. Good afternoon. 
I've now spoken five times at these meetings as a public delegate with the aim to call for a defunding of the police, amplify the voices of black, brown, and marginalized communities targeted by violence, and maintain a consistent pressure on the Ottawa Police Services for accountability, response, change, reaction, and any form of defunding at all with the aim of abolition, which thus far I have seen none of. So today I speak not for the board members as much as the other 30 or so delegates and the the Ottawa community for whom we owe safer communities, justice, and defunding and abolition of the police as opposed to any budget increase. I preface by reiterating my role in the July Community Safety and Wellbeing Consultation Plan by amplifying a call out for stories and what community safety looks like in this city for residents, 160 of whom wrote and a majority of us who stated that our vision of community safety in Ottawa looked like defunding the police. The many of us are speaking here today at the Finance and Audit Committee meeting with that specific growing chorus of a demand, which by the OPS has been called consultation. I call the bare minimum as a duty to listen, take note and take action action of defunding the police. That consultation in both the 160 stories featured in the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan and 30 plus speakers here today, I ask, where is it featured in the budget we are discussing here today? Where is the decrease in your budget, which, if anything, is the only acceptable item we should see in your proposed list of changes? Can it be found in the $13.2 million increase, of which 30 new officers will be hired? Can it be found in the non-existent mental health strategy, placing a mental health professional in a 911 call center and giving mental health training to your call center professionals, but not quite your officers? Can it be found in the neighborhood resource teams, which you will double from three to six regions in Ottawa? This may sound like progress to you, OPS, but we hear an absolute inability to hear the voices of your community. We hear an ignorance to calls for resources back to communities, and we see a failure to even attempt engagement with the idea of defunding the police. We are past the point of consultation, past the point of research, past the point of models, allocating money to create a new solution. Those solutions exist. Solutions have long been played out and research shows that coupling police with mental health response is the wrong path to take of mental health responses. Take even the Halifax mental health strategy such as the crisis intervention teams, paired with a health, pairing a healthcare provider with an officer for every call alongside a province-wide crisis phone line, which at one point blazed a trail in mental health crisis response, are even now seen as behind the times as other provinces shift to more innovative, appropriate responses, moving away from integrating police and any adequate mental health response unit as this budget mistakenly aims to do. Rather than throwing police at the problem, communities have long been asking for resources back, which neighborhood resource teams think they do. This new budget will be funding not only the harm that is the police task force, but the harm that is the NRTs. The neighborhood resource teams, which this budget will be double, would, will double in size, hold a dysfunctional and violent history swept under the rug of the auto police service's favorite tactic of rebranding. Historically modeled after the 200, 2006 pilot program called Operation Jasmine, later called DART, then Pivot, was a failed program with highly specialized officers trained to kill and terrorize marginalized communities like Officer Montsion, who at one point was part of DART, killed Abdurrahman Abdi, during whose trials Operation Jasmine rebranded to DART and by the end of the trials rebranded to Prevention and Intervention of Violence Ottawa, Pivot. Pivot, far from preventing violence, is a failed task force which is now being absorbed in, into the NRTs, whose primary purpose is far from offering resources to neighbors, is nothing more than a policy rebrand of a program designed to target kill, and destroy the very vulnerable communities it claims to protect. In fact, rather than calling them neighborhood resource teams in Ottawa, we should call them what they really are, localized community terrorism units. This budget is the same soup, just reheated, and I will not stand for it today. I stand in opposition of the budget tabled here today, in opposition of any vote to increase it on November 23rd by this board, and as Chief Slowly himself once said, that if we absolutely commit ourselves to improving the quality of our police, then we will improve public trust and police legitimacy, and you don't need a single dollar for that. I stand by that. You don't need a single dollar to improve a broken policing system based on violence, genocide, and racism, and your budget certainly doesn't need any more dollars than it already has. Defund, disarm, and abolish your police force. The city is watching, and we will hold you to it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mar. Um, I don't see any hands. Chair Deans, uh, you're... Uh, did you have any comments since uh, I'm not sure if you're
capable of raising well, I thought, your... But I have found the raised hand button. Now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Are there any other uh, board members that have any questions of uh, the uh, last present presenter? Uh, if not, um, thank you. You you gave a very passionate, uh, and I know you have spoken to us many times, and we, we are hearing you, uh, and uh, we're hearing many different voices, and we are attempting to make it within the system we can. I know some people don't want us to do it within the system, but um, that's the way we're, we're working, and I do believe that we are making steps, uh, and I know that there'll be others that say we're not. Um, but I do appreciate you taking the time to come once again to speak to us. Uh, the next speaker we have is Jack Belmar, uh, Jack, uh, I'll turn it over to you if uh, you're ready. Oh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. You're live. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me here this afternoon. I first want to uh, thank the three women who spoke before me and whose points I want to echo 100%, as well as the seven written statements that were released um, online before the meeting. Today, I want to discuss some of the specific people we talk about when we talk about police community relations. When we talk about new funding for gender-based violence, we discuss officers like Eric Post, Asim Ansari, Kevin Benloss, and Will Hinterberger, who have all been accused of sexual assault yet still work for OPS. We talk about domestic abusers like Carl Keenan and Eric Brisebois, who still work for OPS. We talk about Jason Bond, who is harassing women on Twitter this week and who had already been disciplined, not fired, for harassing women for multiple years back in 2013. Public trust in the Ottawa police cannot be created while the police service shelters those who break the law. Daniel Monson, Abdi Rahman Ali's killer, still works for OPS. Dan Delaney, Troy Emerson's killer, still works for OPS. Daniel Vincelet and Than Tran, Greg Ritchie's killers, still work for OPS. The three cops who took kickbacks from tow truck drivers this spring still work for OPS. Officers like Lise Fournier, Sean Ralph, or Jason Bennett, who have been caught using CPIC to stalk criminal complainants and family members, still work for OPS, as well as 12 drunk drivers, as well as a stunt driver, as well as 11 current officers who have been known to falsify charges. Dozens of other officers like Kirk Batson, Libin Farah, Nerman Messick, Keith Heaton, Stephen DeJordi, or the eight officers who assaulted Roxanne Carr in 2008, all of whom who have made news for assaulting members of the public, all still collect a public salary. On Google, you can find, with no resources, over 75 OPS officers whose actions and treatment demonstrate why Ottawans do not trust the police. If our police service simply fired people who break its standards, it could reallocate over $8 million today. Trust in the Ottawa police will always be impaired by these criminals' presence in law enforcement. Chief Slowly, members of the board, we need your help to end their employment, be it by firing, resignation, or forcing out. It is the only real remedy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think Chair Deans is going to have a, uh, would like to make a few comments on that. Chair, over to you. I'll be very brief, but I just want to say without um, uh, discussing any particular individual that uh, I very much understand and appreciate the point that you are making. Both the Police Services Board and Ottawa City Council um, have uh, taking positions on this. This is not something that the police service currently has within their mandate to do. We are governed by the Police Services Act and provincial legislation, which prevents the firing of these officers or even the suspension without pay until um, they have, um, uh, what is it, um, not only been charged criminally, but convicted uh, with a, I think it's a jail sentence, if I'm not mistaken, I might have the details wrong, but it's something like that. The, the, the measure is very, very high. And uh, both the Police Services Board and the City Council have disagreed with that and have um, asked the province to reverse uh, that particular piece of legislation that would make way for us to um, uh, let go members of the service that we felt uh, should not be working on the Ottawa Police Service. Thank you. 
Thank you much. Thank you very much, Chair. And I, I would just like to make a comment. Uh, we, uh, we as a board cannot get into issues of discipline. And so if, if members of the public do have concerns about discipline or areas like that, this is not the forum for it. Uh, I understand how, how important this is and how, uh, how strongly you feel about it, but we cannot discuss ongoing cases. We cannot entertain discussions about ongoing cases. And if you have, if any of the other uh, presenters have issues and concerns about discipline or that this this is a budget discussion it's a it's not a, a an opportunity to uh, get involved with discussions about individual actions of police officers the board it's very clear in the board's mandate that we do not have the authority to get involved with the discipline of individual officers so i just want to make that comment in general if there are others who wish to, to go into that this isn't the correct forum to do it so with that um the next speaker is uh, robin brown so i'll ask robin to uh, to take the floor great thank you can you hear me yes you can you're live okay. you've got the floor uh good afternoon madam chair board members chief slowly I'm here on behalf of the black groups that are signatories to this statement to give conditional support to the proposed Ottawa Police Service 2021 draft budget. I'm not here to ask you to defund the police yet. The 613819 Black Hub and other black community groups have been working with Chief Slowly since he took charge over a little over a year ago, and we continue to support him in his efforts at making systemic change within the OPS. We're pleased to see his leadership and action taken and those that uh, the OP, uh, OPS proposes to take on diversity and inclusion and mental health response. Regarding mental health, we look forward to being involved at every stage of the review of the city's response to people experiencing mental health crises. The chief says that cutting his budget would hamper his efforts, and we believe him. We therefore want to give him and his team time to implement the next steps in his plan. However, we aren't willing to give him unlimited time. We can't do that because the relationship between the OPS and Ottawa's black community is in crisis and is resulting in us being targeted, hurt, and killed. The OPS slogan is a trusted partner in community safety. However, with the exception of the chief and a few others, Ottawa's black residents currently don't trust the police, see them as partners, or feel safe. And this isn't just because of things like Abdur Mas death. It's also because rank and file OPS officers elected Ottawa Police Association President Matt Scoff in 2011, then let him run uncontested twice since then. This speaks volumes since Scoff is the same man who used a sexist slur to refer to a female member of the Justice for Abdi Rahman Coalition, didn't denounce the recent racist meme against you slowly, and has repeatedly denied the existence of systemic anti-black racism in the force. We see a vote, or a vote of confidence for Scoff, as a vote for the sexist, racist status quo. The fact that the OPS rank and file keep returning Scoff to power, combined with the acquittal of Ottawa Police Officer Daniel Moncia in the death of Abdi Rahman, means there are an unknown number of Ottawa police officers who support racism and sexism and have once again been emboldened to act on their feelings with the full power of their position and little worry of ever being held accountable. The demonstrations following the Monsignor trial verdict are further evidence that the relationship between the OPS and Ottawa's black communities is in crisis. Therefore, although we're willing to give the OPS time to make change, we also want to ensure that the force and the board are moving in the right direction in a key area in addition to mental health, response, use of force, including dynamic raids. Given the current crisis, I'm afraid for every black and indigenous person in Ottawa, including my two teenage sons. I'm afraid they could be in the wrong place at the wrong time when the OPS conducts a dynamic raid or an officer decides they need a punch in the head with armored gloves for their own safety. We are pleased that the board chair de deans moved a motion at the October 26th board meeting calling for the board's policy and governance committee to review the OPS use of force policy, including the use of dynamic raids, and we look forward to being involved at every stage of that review. However, we also call on the Ottawa Police Service to do two things. One, immediately stop using dynamic raids until its review of its use of them is complete, including that they have race-based data on who they're using them on and improve ability to ensure innocent people, including the accused, won't get hurt. And two, immediately report to the community the status of the OPS's review of the school resource program and how the community will be included at every stage of that review. We are pleased that the board recently endorsed the UN Decade for People, people of African Descent. 
City Council's unanimous approval of the motion by Councilors Menard McKinney that the Auto Police Services Board hold public consultations to find alternative models, including non-police responses to people having mental health crises, is also encouraging. However, given the board is responsible for working with the chief to set the Auto Police Services uh, strategic priorities and to ensure the force is on track to meet them, we are concerned that the current crisis greatly impedes the OPS's ability to meet its 2019-2020 strategic priorities to advance community policing and to make meaningful progress on diversity and inclusion. In my opening statement, I said we are here to give conditional support to the proposed police budget. Chief slowly says he's aware, he's not aware of a successful example of a city that defunded its police force to fund social programs. Actually, there is one, and I believe it's Houston. But yeah, that may be, but like, but like him being hired as Ottawa's top cop, there's a first time for everything. Ottawa's black residents will not trust the police, see them as partners or feel safe until we see real progress on these goals. We're willing to give the OPS time to make that happen, but if it, become, but if it becomes clear at some point in the near future that cutting the police budget is required, that's what we'll be calling for. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I see um, uh, Member Johnson uh, has a question. Member Johnson, over to you, please. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so just to build on uh, what Robin has said about the use of force and dynamic entries would be a question really for the board and the police service to look at in terms of the percent of training costs that was spent on mental health intercultural competency and the escalation training compared to previous years. So I just would like to, us to consider it, but we don't have to answer this now in the middle of the presentation, but at some point consider this question. Certainly, I think that's an excellent uh, suggestion and we can certainly do that. I see there is another hand up, but uh, all I see is a hand with a two next to it. So I'm not sure who I'm, I'm inviting to speak now. I think it's Councillor uh, King. Uh, okay, Councillor King, <laughs> over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Robin, uh, for uh, your presentation. I did have a question about your timeline. Um, I'm just curious, uh, what's the timeline uh, if you're going to give conditional support? And uh, would that correspond ideally with some of the uh, initiatives uh, that uh, the OPS has undertaken uh, that, are, that are clearly enumerated in, in this budget? Um, well, that's a, the the OPS budget is, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rosen, but it's approved every year, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so you know, I'd say that. Um, well, it, although it, it, it so certainly in terms of the next budget, right? We'd be looking at that. That's one one timeline, but it's it, it's really initiative by initiative too, right? So, so, so for example, we want to be involved in the reviews of the mental health response and use of force. If we for example, don't like the way those, those are going and we see that, that there's not really um, a true community consultation, then we're gonna switch right away. We have, we, we have to see those progressing. So it's, you know, it, it varies from initiative to initiative. So would it be fair to say that if there are benchmarks that are established, uh, you know, through the consultation process and we, we see progress on those, on those benchmarks, uh, then um, uh, I guess the Black Hub would be supportive and uh, would, you know, continue to provide oversight, uh, continue continue to provide input, uh, but would be generally supportive of, of the uh, way forward. Yeah. Okay, that's fair. I appreciate okay. it. I appreciate it, Joe. Thank you very much, Rolson. And uh, thank you very much, Robin, for the, your presentation. Um, the next person we're going to be hearing from is Ewan Wheaton. Uh, Ewan, it's uh, over to you. Good morning, afternoon, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm audible, okay, I'm audible. Uh, yes. Thank you to the board for allowing me this opportunity to speak. I'm a private citizen and uh, not here representing any group but myself. Uh, I did prepare some comments, but most of them have already been covered by the previous speakers. So I would simply like to um, voice my support for most of the opinions previously expressed. Uh, the discontentment with the current situation in Ottawa policing is extreme and uh, all of those groups have spoken to it in a manner that I uh, couldn't hope to measure up to in terms of research, particularly Octava and the Black Hub. Uh, I, my personal issues that I would like to speak to are uh, 
to do with the budget as it has as it has been presented today. So, for instance, uh, there's been a heavy emphasis on discussion of consultations, consultations with community, consultations with different members, uh, consultations with stakeholders, wonderful buzzwords that we've all heard before. And my question is, how does consultation result in action? And how do we as citizens, ex how do we as citizens ensure that these consultations are respected, followed up with? What are the metrics going to be? What uh, what accountability, that's another fun buzzword, is there for the Ottawa police? How are we to ensure that when we go to these consultations, our time and effort in <laughs> giving our opinions is respected? So many independent, volunteer-run groups have already spoken today, and I don't know how they are being compensated for their time, and I don't know if they have any reassurance that their voices are going to be heard. They have no recourse if the police simply choose to ignore <laughs> their um, their opinions and they are and the facts that have been presented. It is not enough, I think, to simply have a public consultation without any commitments being made and without many measurements against which the public can say, well, this is or is not acceptable. I don't believe there is sufficient civilian oversight, even with this board as it is done. I don't believe we have a meaningful way to impact police policy as it stands. And I feel that this is simply not enough. I, I have done some limited research. Uh, you know, in Nunavut, there has been created a uh, civilian, there is legislation in place to essentially create civilian police oversight with cultural competence. There is there are attempts being made to more stringently limit what can and cannot be done in these situations. I'm sorry, I'm rambling slightly. Uh, the point I'm coming to is that there cannot a consultation is not sufficient without accountability and without the ability for the public to then uh, potentially hold police to account when their concerns are not met. That is. Uh, that is the amount of it. I also would like to voice support for a previously missed over motion to uh, redirect some police funds to healthcare. I am disappointed as a voter and as a citizen that this motion was not followed through with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ewan. And um, I understand your concern about consultation without then follow up action, but I, I can tell you that. Um, I was part of the previous board that uh, did outreach to the communities and we held meetings right across the city and these meetings were well attended. And at each meeting, uh, it was read, led by various community groups who expressed what they thought was the direction the police should take. And out of those, that series of meetings came two uh, very clear things. And, I understand that maybe the, the community's wishes and needs and desires have changed since that last set of uh, public uh, hearings we had, or public meetings we had. But at that those particular meetings, it was very clear that people wanted to see community-led policing. They wanted to see community police officers. And uh, the other thing was, and it was it was the the, the clear need for a for a fairly dramatic change of direction to reflect how the city was changing that led to our reaching out for and eventually hiring Chief Peter Slowly. So it, it, I can absolutely assure you that the board was listening, is listening, and intends to continue listening. This is not something where you're, you're spending time coming and it's falling on deaf ears. We are hearing, we are listening. We don't always get it right. In fact, it seems that sometimes we seem to get it wrong more often than we get it right. But we absolutely are trying, and I can assure you that led by Chair Deans, there is a strong commitment by every member of the board to try to make sure that we bring the changes the community has made very clear that they want to see happening. And everybody will not be happy, but we are doing the best we can to try to get uh, the, the direction right uh, as we go forward. So you're certainly not wasting your time, and we do appreciate that you've taken the time to come out and speak to us. I don't see any, any other hands up. I do. Uh, Member Nerman, uh, you're the first one to put your hand up, so please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> and I thank you, Anne, for uh, giving uh, an honest and a forthright uh, uh, opinion and expressing your concerns. And I, I totally echo what Chair Smallwood has said. And under the leadership of uh, Chair Deans, 
I can definitely tell that we all, we all are committed. We are, we are listening. And uh, of course, uh, each time there may be some issues which may not be implemented right away, but whatever you say, and uh, there are a few things which we, we, we cannot discuss in public, but we are getting a po other feedbacks. And I can assure you that each and every concerns which come to our attention individually or through the board is listened. So, but thank you again for coming up and reinforcing the, the need of the community and keeping us on the check that we should not be sleeping or we should not be, uh, we, we have to work, we have to listen and we will. Thank you. Thank you, Member Nerman. Member Sueda. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Chair uh, Sandy, for that. And uh, and I just basically I just want to echo um, pretty much what um, Member Nerman had said, and also expand a little bit on what Member Smallwood had said as well. Is that we are uh, listening, and uh, and I think Chair Deans also mentioned that we have to work within the restrictions that we're given. There's a lot of provincial legislation that that guides us on what we can do or restricts us on what we can do. Um, doesn't mean that change cannot happen. It just means it might take a little bit longer than everybody would like to see. And uh, I believe that uh, under uh, Chief uh, Slowly and uh, Chair Deans and the board, uh, we will move um, in the right direction. It just takes a little bit more time. But thank you again for your comments. Thank you, Member Sueda. Uh, I don't see any other hands up. So, uh, Ewan, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to come out and speak to us today. The thank next you. person on our uh, list is uh, Emma Richter. So, Emma, uh, if you're ready, we're ready to hear from you. Krista, do we have Emma? Do you, do you see if Emma's on the... Uh... Yes, she's there. She has been unmuted, but I don't see any volume signs on her mic. Emma, could you try the volume on your mic? We're not hearing you. Okay, we seem to be... It seems like uh, perhaps Emma's having some technical difficulties. Um, I, uh, I'll say that if, uh, if Emma can send a, a message or something, we can uh, try to get back to her or she can send her comments in, in writing. I'll move on now to uh, number nine on the list, which is Christine Burton. Christine, uh, are you available to, uh, to speak to us now? Sandy, I'm not trying a Christine Burton logged in right now. Okay, <laughs> uh, then I'll move on to number 10 which is Matteo, either Simelero or Kimelero. I'm not sure. I'm, I know I'm getting it wrong one way or the other, but uh, Matteo, uh, are you available to speak to us now? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. It's Simelero, okay. by the way. <laughs> Simelero, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry oh, about okay. that. <laughs> but, uh, please, definitely. you have the floor. Okay, for sure. So good afternoon. I wanted to begin by saying his name, Anthony Aw. Mr. Aw's life was tragically cut short from an egregious display of force equal to something one would see in Afghanistan. Without warning, a door was busted, a smoke grenade set off, and several officers with assault rifles stormed in to only find Mr. Aw's 68-year-old stepfather, 94-year-old grandmother, and younger siblings. Mr. Aw's had jumped out the window 12 stories high. It's a worrying trend of what I hope is not a furthering militarization of the Ottawa police. After I read the report, a national story, my heart sunk. It was devastating, it was heartbreaking, and frankly, it was embarrassing, and something needs to be done. I'm upset and I'm angry, and this is why I'm here to demand action. Before I continue, I want to read words from Mr. Aw's brother, Raymond. He told Vice News, quote, there's a reason why people of color were more marginalized. There's stereotypes that surround them that basically vilify them, that take away their humanity. Obviously, when police come, came in, they only saw a record. They didn't see a person. The only goal was to get him. It wasn't to help him, end quote. 
that last and devastating and necessary phrase, the only goal was to get him, it wasn't to help him, is how I'll spend the remaining amount of my time. First, I wanted to voice my support for the unanimously passed motion tabled by Councillor Menard and McKinney. I support and hope for an ad hoc mental health service that can de-escalate crises without the specter of lethal weapons. The past motion I counsel with hopeful and optimistic. Although the motion itself remains vague, and I hope that funding, particularly in proportion to the increased budget for new officer growth, will be as hopeful and optimistic. Motions and unanimous yeses serve moral assurances, but do nothing for the people. Only cash and resources do that. As for no-knock raids, these need to be scrupulously reviewed and restricted. As for community policing, I hope that the police service board will at least question its role as an end all solution to the problems of policing. A recent poll by the Angus Reid Institute noted that less than half of the Canadians across racial demographics felt safer when police were present. As in the case of the late Mr. Abdi, police in the city have proven that they can act in a lethal manner without facing repercussion. Seeing people with guns, even despite the symbolic nature of the badge, is frightening, and even more so with the knowledge that they have, more often than not, the protection of the justice system. Being mixed race, both Korean and white, I know the differences how the police treat members of society. My white father has never been treated adversely. My Korean mother has been followed by the RCMP and been treated less than human at the hands of the Ottawa police. Now the problems of community policing is not a mere political issue, but essentially a structural and logical one. Eugene O'Donnell, a former NYPD officer and professor of criminal justice told NPR, quote, Generally, the community policing that people liked, elected officials like, is the community policing that sort of frays the hard edges of policing and makes it seem as though everything can be done in a happy way, blunts the adversarial nature of the police job, and suggests that people can get along well and there's no room for conflict, when, in fact, police are a job that involves conflict, end quote. Indeed, it is the adversarial nature of the job that is inherent. Police are there to challenge criminality and to uphold order. And this is what makes the promises of community policing extremely difficult, if not impossible to enact on a consistent basis. In other words, there always has to be a conflict. Having more police officers in the street under the guise of community policing may have an inadvert effect to your mandates and values. I call upon you to think about this, read about it, and remember when drafting legislation, budgets, and statements surrounding your solutions to the problems of policing. Lastly, I want to address defund the police and its history to give you a historical backdrop to the movement's rage and reason. Policing history does not favor trust in the communities that have been historically seen as enemies of the state. From police killings of black Canadians dating decades, to the 200 years of slavery in Canada, to the RCMP's role in Western expansion and residential schools. Since even before the beginning, policing in our country has been entangled with colonial oppression and colonial authentication. Anthony Aw's death has been yet another manifestation Hence the call for less police officers, not more. This is the history of defund the police. So when you hear it, do not think it's just an arbitrary punishment or just an arbitrary numerical value, but rather a systematic and symbolic reallocation, a policy driven act to replace armed coercions of order to non-lethal and constructive modes of care, particularly for the most vulnerable and marginalized in our community. Raymond Aw's words echo here. The only goal was to get him. It wasn't to help him. I thank you all for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. And I, I certainly, uh, one of the things, one of the comments you made, I think is, is something that we're becoming increasingly aware of, and that is, is just the presence of a police officer can escalate something. It can be intimidating to some people. And I think that's why, and, and uh, Johnson had mentioned the importance of the de-escalation training and the board is aware of that. And, and this is something we're going to be looking at very closely is getting a better understanding of, of what, is, what is the proper way to go about so that, that just the presence of police, even if they're doing their best to make a situation better, inadvertently they escalate it rather than de-escalate it. And this is something that certainly has to be looked at. Um, so I certainly appreciate your comments. I don't see any questions from any other board members. Are there any others who wish to ask any questions of Matteo? 
Uh, I'm not seeing any, so I wanted to thank you. Thank you for taking the time and coming to speak to us. And um, uh, I'll now move on to the... To, in fact, what I'll do is I'll see if Emma is, uh, is now able to join us. Emma Richter, are you able to, uh, can you to join me? us? Yes, I can. I can hear you now. Oh, perfect. I apologize. I had uh, technical difficulties. My mic stopped oh. working all of a sudden. <laughs> well, great. You're, out, you're live now. So thank you for joining us. Um, thank you for uh, inviting us to share our thoughts today. Um, I just wanted to start by uh, thanking Mar, actually. I just want to thank them for their passion because their sentiments really reflect the way that I also feel about policing in Ottawa and also all the other speakers that um, have spoken before me. Um, so the 2021 proposed budget uh, increases the OPS budget by $13.2 million. Um, this has been said that it's a response to community demands following the George Floyd protests. Um, however, the Black Lives Matter movement has always asked for a defunding of the police. So I'm not really sure why the response would be an increase in funds to police services. It's starting to read a bit like a counteroffensive approach. Um, which is not exactly the way that we want to work. I mean, we want to work as a community to protect black lives. And I don't really understand why this would ever be considered an offense against police if the goal of policing is to increase community safety. Um, I'd also like to echo Ewan's disappointment in the refusal to redirect funds to public health because people, including myself, have waited several hours in lines for COVID testing, been waiting weeks for results. Um, we're entering flu season. People are not getting tested purely because of the inconvenience of it. And I'm not really understanding how an increase to the police budget is a better use of money opposed to um, councillors Menard and McKenney's motion to transfer the funds to public health in the middle of a global pandemic. Uh, and I further don't understand the continued justification of this choice in the middle of a second wave in a COVID hot zone. Um, another point that I wanted to address was uh, outreach. I know that um, Chair Deans released a survey to community members to express our thoughts on the way that OPS has been conducting. Um, it wasn't very well promoted and it kind of came across like you didn't want the opinions of the population. Um, the whole we are trying sentiment around outreach frankly isn't enough. There needs to be a commitment. Um, as a public servant myself, I don't really get paid to do my best. I don't think anybody else does either. I get paid to do my job. So if the system is not working and lives are at stake, it's time for a fundamental change. Words at this point don't mean very much to us. We need action, we need transparency, we need a plan. Uh, additionally, the $13.2 million increase is six times the amount the city has committed to the energy evolution plan. Um, as the capital city, I'm not sure if we're going green or not. Um, Furthermore, in the budget, we've drafted $225,000 to address training on de-escalation, but the best thing you could possibly do to encourage de-escalation and discourage violent conduct is sanction officers that escalate violent situations and that participate in police misconduct. Um, Mr. Belmer gave a very thorough rundown of misconduct within OPS, which I won't repeat. And I also understand that it's not um, within the scope of the board to speak about ongoing investigations into misconduct cases. However, I feel like the majority of us can agree that if we killed someone at work, we would not have our jobs. Um, this culture within OPS isn't really that surprising considering that at a recent OPS board meeting, Chief slowly said that he took pride in OPS's no use of force incidents at peaceful protests. However, this isn't really something that needs to be congratulated. This is supposed to be an expectation not to use force on peaceful civilians. The comments were tone deaf and they revealed a culture of use of force which has been allowed to ferment within OPS. I understand that the board is subject to legislation. However, are you doing the work to combat the legislation that protects violent police? This is your wheelhouse. What work are you doing to keep your force safe? Is this work being made public? Without discussing the specifics of individual cases, can you advocate for the public holistically? Is there a number of deaths which are acceptable? I mean, at what point does officer misconduct become an issue of urgency? When do deaths stop being part of the job? They shouldn't be part of the job. Violence is the antithesis to community safety. So what is the number of civilians deaths that is acceptable before action is taken? Um, 
issues like homelessness, addiction, they're not police issues, they're housing and public health issues. COVID is a public health issue. Mental health is a public health issue. When people experience a physical health crisis, such as a heart attack or anaphylaxis, we send an ambulance. So I'm not sure why it is the mandate of police, law enforcement, to address mental health crises and why you continue to defend this mandate. Obviously, other services don't have the capacity right now to address mental health crises the way that we need them to, but neither do the police, which is why you're asking for more money to address these issues. But then if we provide other organizations the money that you're asking for, it would empower them to build that infrastructure. So you can't take resources out of the hands of other organizations and then say they don't have the resources to handle it because the community has been asking for community-led mental health responses that would not involve police. And you yourselves have said that you don't want to be responsible and you're not equipped for mental health emergency response. But as it stands, you are the emergency response. So I'm not really sure how that logic follows. Um, we know that Chief... Or, so just, uh, just to let you know, Emma, you, your, your, your time is up. So if you could sort of wrap it up or... Yeah, no, I'm at my last point, which is Great. that okay. uh, Good. transparency could solve a lot of the issues. I mean, it could help us really find trust in the police. Um, I just want to know if there is a plan to make police policing more transparent within Ottawa. Um, so, okay, uh, I think, um, Chair Deans, you might want to make a comment. I'm perhaps putting you on the spot, but I know that some of the points that Emma's talked on, certainly I can tell you, Emma, you made a comment about uh, us can fit, continuing to defend the mandate of police responding to mental health calls, and that certainly isn't the case. We, uh, there has been a long recognition that the, the, uh, the things have ended up on the police table, which shouldn't be there. Police are responding to things that, that perhaps there are other people better equipped and trained to respond to. And mental health is certainly a, a, a very, very strong example of that. Uh, I guess the question that, that uh, people can legitimately have is, since this has been well known, why has it taken so long to to change why has it taken so long to make these changes why are police still responding to these and uh, i think it, and it's not going to help you to know but that frustration is shared i think across the board it's shared by police boards it's shared by police chiefs it's shared by police officers they're trained for one with one set of skills and they're often put in a situation that they weren't trained for and uh, they're not the right people to necessarily be responding for it. And that is something that we're all aware of. And we run into conflicting mandates where policing is a municipal uh, issue and uh, mental health and health is a provincial rather than municipal. And so where the, 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 when the province shut down 2000 beds, uh, the, the issue was did they put the funding in place and this is going back, this isn't current, this isn't the current government or anything, this is going back some time, but there, there are the seeds of the issues we have now were sown a long time ago and we're all struggling to find a way to move forward with this so that we don't leave a gap where there isn't somebody who's properly trained to do the response. And the chair has mentioned this earlier, mentioned the importance of trying to put together a model uh, and we have looked at models right across North America and, in fact, elsewhere. There's a very powerful model in Scotland uh, that was, uh, uh, was brought over in part to Canada uh, called the Hub Model, which looked at not having the police as the lead on some of these, but rather having a, a situation table where the various players, which could be mental health, housing, addiction, homelessness, there are so many issues uh, and the police should not be leading. And we're aware of that. And the uh, Chair Deans is, is part of the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan, where we try to take a more holistic look at response to issues and not have the police being the lead on these because we know that the police aren't always the best. So, uh, but perhaps, are there any other board members who want to make a comment or answer or ask Emma any questions? I'm not seeing any other hands up now. So Emma, thank you again for your thoughts and comments and joining us today. Um, I'll move on now to the, to the next person on our list, which is uh, Laura Shantz. Laura, uh, your 
um, I see your hand raised, but you're, you've got the floor. So you, you don't need to put your hand up because the floor is <laughs> okay, yours. Okay, great. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Um, well, thank you for having me um, just to get started. So we know that we're in a time of austerity in many segments of our government, and the Ottawa Police Services has presented an expansionist budget that adds on continuing annual costs in the form of an increased number of police officers. At this same time, city services and nonprofit organizations across our city are seeing their budgets frozen or decreased as they are not receiving as many donations. When we have heard many nice words about not being a business as usual budget, we still see growing expenditures on salaries, including those 30 new officers, and funds for weapons included in this amount. While there are some token amounts allocated to items like de-escalation training and dealing with sexual harassment on the force, these pale in comparison to the overall budget envelope. We need to recognize that a, and I quote, business as different and better budget is not necessarily going to deliver the results we want for our community. When the focus is always on expansion, we can never tackle the root issues that the residents of the city have flagged through consultations, such as over-policing of marginalized communities and racist practices. When we focus on expansion, we often just have more of the same thing, maybe with some better PR and nicer language. Let's be clear, more is not better. Just like so many other services that focus on trying to help and intervene in the community, especially in minority and low-income communities, the majority of police efforts should be focused on police trying to work themselves out of a job not growing their presence. If we're truly serving and protecting people, that means we will have a far lesser need for many police services. I shouldn't need to walk along Montreal Road with my Indigenous friends in order for them to feel safe from police harassment. I shouldn't need to worry about what will happen to the Black and Indigenous youth in my community should they find themselves in trouble with the law. Truly making our communities safe would mean addressing these issues, not adding officers and firearms. Now, by training, I'm both, I have training in both criminology and economics. So let's think creatively about what, could this, about what it could mean for low-income marginalized communities here in Ottawa. Let's think about opportunity costs. If we only have $10 to spend and we spend it all on apples, we can't buy bananas. We're making choices with our money. So let's think about some other choices. Thinking about those 30 proposed new hires earning a base salary of just under $70,000 a piece. With that money, we could give a year of rent supplements to 170 families who are waiting for affordable housing in our city to ensure that they can get into they can get into safe, affordable housing right away, not in a year and a half or two years when the units promised in the 2021 budget are completed and ready for occupancy. For the salary of a single first class constable, we could provide a community with two child and youth workers or two outreach workers to support our indigenous residents. For the base salary of five new hires, the city could match its core funding to a drop-in center to serve marginalized residents. Centers like the St. Joe's Women's Center operate only about $350,000 a year of city funding. And I'm sure there's, I can guarantee you that the, the demand for services outstrips the supply. For the base salary of one new hire, we could provide high quality childcare to five children whose families cannot afford it. Imagine what we could do if even 10% of the proposed budget increase, 1.3 million, was put to our neighborhood community houses and the good work that they do combating poverty and hunger and helping marginalized residents across the city access services, gain new skills and seek employment. Each of these examples takes a small chunk of enforcement money and reinvests it in measures that are proven to prevent crime, just like Chief slowly talked about in the beginning when he gave his presentation. I could give dozens more examples of trade-offs that we're making or that we could make with this money. What I want to emphasize is that everyone here, everyone who's speaking on every side of this issue, we're all putting forward measures and ideas that we will believe will produce safe communities. We all want communities that are vibrant and safe. And I think most of us recognize that everyone, and I do mean everyone, even those who use drugs or those who can't afford a place to live or those who engage in survival sex work or those who are hungry, and especially those who face discrimination based on their race, class, addictions, or mental health, all of them deserve to feel safe, supported, and respected in their communities. Everyone deserves the right to feel safe in their home and in their community. But we cannot achieve this by force. I urge you to think about reinvesting some of this money in other ways that would actually reduce crime in the long run. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Laura. Um... I see uh, Member Johnson has her hand up, so I'll first turn it over to you, uh, Bev. Uh, thank you, Chair. 
Uh, Laura, thank you for your wise words and your very important observations of what our community needs here in Ottawa. These are all very, very important issues. And I really, I really uh, do hope our city focuses on these and makes substantial difference in all these areas. I'm just going to go back one more time to de-escalation again. And, and my comments for us as a board to look at with the service is what is the cost per that, what is the amount we're spending per officer on de-escalation training? And how, how can we, how can we add to that? Is that by providing maybe three hours of training per year? So I just hope that we look more closely at this one topic and um, how to effectively make that change. So I just thought I'd add those comments to, to and thank you again, Laura, for all that you said about the community issues. Thank you. Thank Beth. you very much. Thank you, Bev. Um, <clears throat> uh, Laura, I just want to comment one thing you said, which I remember my dentist said to me once that he was he was one profession that was working to put himself out of business, and I think you're right. I think that is uh, what the police should be doing. Uh, in fact, it might be you may well know this, but the Bible of policing, sort of the the what governance is supposed to look to, as as uh, even though it's it's 200 years old. Oh, one of the principles of policing, the test of police efficiency, is the absence of crime and disorder, not the visible evidence of police action in dealing with it. So you're absolutely right. They, we should be trying to make sure that the success isn't necessarily more police or more heavily armed police or more visible police in our streets. It should be less success is, is, is less police and the need for less police. And I think that, that that is where, and I certainly hope that is where we are as a board headed and, and, and taking steps to go that way. And I hope that, um, that we will be able to do that. Um, I just don't know whether we're going to be able to do it as quickly as some people would like, but um, I do thank you for your comments because uh, I, I, I certainly agree. And I think that uh, we, um, we need to look at uh, why, why is it that we're expanding the number of officers? And I believe that the, the, the reason that one of the reasons, one of the main reasons we've looked at it is that we're hoping that the growth of the police service will allow us to have a service that is much more diversified and better reflects the community it serves. And that, as the CAO Letourneau mentioned earlier, uh, our most recent hiring class was a dramatic improvement in both the racial diversity and gender diversity of the officers that are coming into the service. So we have a new, much more diverse service to, to um, go out and, and work with and hopefully work to what we certainly agree with you. Our goal is community safety and well-being. So uh, I want to thank you again. I don't see any other hands up for you. So I want to thank you for taking the time to come and speak to us today. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Um, the next member, uh, the next member of the public to speak to us is Paul Jorgensen. Uh, Paul, are you, um, are you available to speak to us now? Uh, I am. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. You're you're Excellent. live. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so I've never actually spoken before at committee before, so uh, uh, this will be my first time. And, I, and I'd like to just start by explaining where I'm coming from to help you evaluate uh, what I'm saying. So uh, I'm not speaking on behalf of anyone or any organization. I'm just speaking as a private citizen. Uh, and, and who I am at my core is basically a numbers guy. Uh, and I've led a career focused largely on both sides of the contractor divide, basically being a, uh, a contractor as well as overseeing uh, contractors and service providers. And, and that background basically informs how I approach this issue. So we're being asked to increase the police budget this year. So I put myself in my own shoes here. And if a contractor or service provider of mine asks me for more money, my first instinct is to look at the past budget performance results, etc. 
So let's start with 2013 as a baseline here. And this is particularly apropos because the chair noted just two minutes ago, actually, about the Bible of policing being the absence of crime. So with what the chair just said in mind, let's look at 2013. According to StatsCan, in 2013, the crime rate in Ottawa was 4,040 per 100,000 population. And it's hovered around that same amount ever since. In 2019, which is the last date that StatsCan has public data for, the crime rate in Ottawa stood at 4,381 per 100,000 people. So actually slightly up from 2013. Now, if this was one of my service providers, if this was one of my contractors, looking at these results, I would say this is an underperforming contractor. And to further underline how underperforming this contractor is, for the last 30 years, we've actually seen crime reduction across the board in this country. So we should have actually been seeing, at a minimum, a reduction in crime in this city. Now let's take a look at what these results cost us. So in 2013, the police budget net was $256 million. I'm grabbing that stats from the Ottawa Police website itself. We just heard the proposal for the 2021 police budget stands at $332 million. That's a $76 million increase since 2013. So put yourself in my shoes. Imagine this proposal. $76 million more, zero extra benefit for me, the same or worst results for me, long-term pattern of poor performance, and no mitigating factors to explain this massive price spike. There was no catastrophic expense incurred, no hyperinflation at any point in the supply chain. And all they have to offer us is the promise that this time it'll be different. This time you're going to get better results for your money, a la Lucy and Charlie Brown in the football. Now put yourself in my shoes. What would happen to me if I greenlit a proposal from such an audacious contractor? Well, in all likelihood, I'd be fired. Okay. Now, I don't have much of a background in municipal politics, so when I'm looking to kind of understand how the situation uh, uh, shakes out, I look to what the experts are saying, and I did that. And what I did when I, when I looked, I learned that this is not a partisan or ideological issue. On the right, the noted conservative think tank, the Fraser Institute, has been advocating for reducing bloated police budgets for years. They note, and I'm quoting directly here from the Fraser Institute, that there is, quote, growing public concern over the rising cost and sustainability of police services, given that crime rates continue to decline, police salaries rise, and arbitrators often settle police contracts without taking a municipality's ability to pay into account, end quote. And on the left, we have the Ottawa Coalition for a People's Budget that has published their alternative municipal budget in 2021. And I would urge this committee to look at how they outline how easily we could save up to $235 million from our bloated police budget. In real terms, we've seen the city of Calgary voted just recently to slash their police budget. And this is not exactly a city that's known as a bastion of radicalism or intemperate city management. So I want to close by inviting you to consider what you're going to say when you'll be asked why you willingly gave $76 million more to an underperforming service provider in exchange for no results, no improved transparency, and no material benefit to the city. Will you say that it's because the city couldn't find anything else that could use $76 million? No, $76 million for homelessness, mental health, public health, housing, transportation, sanitation, all of those issues are good in your books? Or will you say that you couldn't be bothered to find efficiencies to make cuts in that budget and in effect proclaim yourselves as bad stewards of the money? And I want you to think hard about what you're going to answer to that, because I promise you these questions will not be going away once this committee is finished. We are paying attention and people like myself who are presenting for the first time are engaged. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, and for a first presenter, you certainly uh, are well prepared, and um, I, I do appreciate that. I've been involved in business a long time, and I'm not an accountant. I don't know accounting, but I do know uh, spreadsheets and balance sheets, and I do hear what you're saying. And if it was as simple as a direct line between X number of dollars in and, X, and a certain reduction in crime, you would be absolutely right. 
Of course, it's not that simple, and I'm sure you probably appreciate that. Uh, if there had been a button we could have pushed a while ago that would have uh, reduced the amount of cost of policing in the city, we would have done it. Um, but but it, police don't just uh, get involved with crime. Perhaps that's all they should be involved with, and perhaps at some point or other there will be uh, other bodies that take over the responsibilities that have ended up on the police's shoulders. But police do so much more, and in fact, currently are getting involved uh, because of cyber, because of cyber crime, because of issues with with um, uh, so many new things that have cropped up and have ended up on the police plate that unfortunately uh, it's not as simple as saying, well, here's how many uh, issues of, of crime, of violent crime we had, and therefore there should be a direct reduction in the cost of policing. Uh, I don't think there's any question that, that uh, we can, and in fact, it's not the board that does it. We, we ask the, the service to do it. We ask them to come back to us and justify the costs, the hires, the, the amount of infrastructure they have, the amount of equipment they have. And that's what this budget process is for. And I can, I can assure you that every one of us, uh, if there was something that was obvious in terms of, of wastage or, or expenditures that were not necessarily, uh, we're not just going to turn our backs to it and ignore it because that's the easy thing to do. Um, I see Robert, uh, Member Sueda has their hand up, and I think Robert also, being a businessman, will have some comments on that. So uh, I'll turn it over to Robert. To, uh, you have some questions or comments, Robert? Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you, Paul, for your presentation. You definitely make uh, a definitely a compelling argument to justify, um, you know, how we can reduce the budget or why we should reduce the budget. Um, I just wanted to just to add something to um, what Chair uh, Sandy has said, is that uh, Ottawa also has unique um, scenarios that are, are unique to Ottawa. And I know you're you're citing a whole bunch of national statistics and numbers. However, we, Ottawa does have some specific um, uh, issues that we're dealing with. And I think Chief mentioned one earlier being a geographical, the size of the geography. So there are many things that we have to take into consideration as well. But nobody's, nobody's questioning the fact that if there's a way to do something better for a cheaper cost, um, it definitely should be done. And um, I believe... Um, and I don't want to speak on behalf of all the members, but I believe everybody is kind of on the same page where we are looking for ways to find efficiencies. And I believe the chief um, with our uh, CAO and, and others at the, at the service are looking for ways to find efficiencies. It is something that uh, is uh, of importance to me to find a better way of delivering the service to the public at a better cost. So I really appreciate your comments, Paul, and uh, and keep holding us, uh, holding our feet to the fire. Did you have a, any question for Paul, or because Paul, I see you have your hand up, but unless the member had a question for you, we'll we'll be moving on to the next because we have so many, we have to keep going. So, was there a specific question you wanted to ask of Paul, uh, Robert, or is or no, just uh, just just more of saying that we are hearing uh, what he's saying, and uh, and uh, that we are going to continue to work on finding efficiencies. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. And Paul, if you have any further comments, please feel free to uh, direct them to the board. Um, we do have a lot of uh, people who wish to speak today, so we're trying to move it along. But uh, I do encourage you to, to keep in touch and, and send any additional comments you may have to the board. The next person that we have who's up to speak is um, Aaron Rothschild. Uh, Aaron, if you're available. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. You're live. Perfect. All right. So today I want to speak to the Ottawa Police Services plan to develop and implement a mental health strategy in the next three years, including consultation and discussion about potential alternative non-police emergency response. I'm sure that everything I'm about to say will be repetition of points already made and points that will be made again, but I'd still like to add my voice to the crowd. While I appreciate that the service and board recognize that the recurring mistreatment of members of the community experiencing mental health crises by many police officers is unacceptable and that action must be taken to protect those who are ill, I know that I speak for many, many members of the community when I say that a police-involved response and solution to this mistreatment and lack of proper care is absolutely and unequivocally the wrong way to do this. 
The continued involvement of police in mental health emergency care is overt criminalization of mental illness and puts every member of the community experiencing mental health or mental illness at risk of maltreatment that could cause serious harm or death. We've seen time and time again the incompetence and aggression of officers towards patients. And I say patients because the emergency is a health emergency. Just as a person being treated by a paramedic for a stroke is a patient, a person experiencing a mental health crisis or displaying symptoms is a patient in need of emergency specialized health care. No matter how many trainings or consultations, police are law enforcement, not health care providers. Health care is not and should never be their job. By continuing to put the responsibility of handling these crises on the police, you deny proper and potentially life-saving health care to sick members of the community. I hear board members' enthusiasm to shift the responsibility of responding to mental health emergencies from the police, but I'm surprised at the confusion of who to give this task to. We have many organizations, some led by healthcare services and some community-led, that are more than qualified and connected to be able to develop the kind of services the community needs, and it seems to me that the task is as simple as providing them with the funds and resources to do so. Mental health professionals have come out in droves recently to call for the removal of police from the front lines of mental health emergency care, including our largest mental health hospital, the Centre for Addictions and Mental Health. We need you to listen to the experts. The task of developing and providing proper emergency mental health care must be led exclusively by mental health care professionals and community organizations that represent and advocate for marginalized members of the community, and funding must reflect that. The reallocation of funds from the police budget to healthcare and community organizations is not a punishment for the OPS. It's simply the moving of funds from an organization that cannot and should not perform the task to organizations that can and should. I hear Chief slowly mention that the service agrees that police should be less involved in the mental health emergency responses, but I want to emphasize that community doesn't just want less involvement, we do not want the police to be involved at all. I also want to respond to Chief Slowly's statement that the police will just be partners in this endeavor and not the head at the head of the table. Um, it doesn't go missed by the public that the word consultations is often an empty word that is just another way of saying leave us in charge and does not promise any sort of responsibility to implement suggestions from those consultations. Even with consultations, no matter how many, the police are still completely unqualified and the wrong service to be involved in any sort of health emergency response. On top of this, the police have had decades to develop adequate mental health emergency responses and still 70% of the people killed in, by police in Canada from 2000 to 2018 were suffering from mental illness. It could not be more clear that they are incapable of leading this response. If the police are truly as open as they claim to be claim to be to a non-police emergency response to mental health emergencies, we would be seeing an aggressive budget reallocation that reflected that. Instead, we see a budget that simply that will simply entrench the police in attacks they cannot perform. Chief Slowly and the members of the board, you each have been given a privilege, the privilege of being in a position that gives you the power to work with City Council to reallocate these funds to the services and organizations who can create the proper response. And I hope that each of you take that responsibility, the responsibility of protecting the lives of so many members of your community extremely seriously. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Erin, and I can absolutely assure you we do take that extraordinarily seriously. Um, are there any board members who wish to ask any questions to the presenter? I'm not, uh, yes, Chair Deans. Chair? Sorry, sorry about that. Thank you, Aaron, for your input. I think it's fair to say that every member of the board is listen, listening intently uh, to what the members of the public are saying. Uh, ultimately, we will, you know, um, find a path forward. Um, but I was interested in you said police should not be involved at all. Um, the calls that come into the call centre, um, some may well be mental health calls, but they present as something else. Uh, sometimes they present as a crime in progress, as someone wielding a gun, as someone causing a sexual assault. Um, so without having police involved, without that call going to the call centre, without a mental health worker being in that call centre, how, how do we just take police on day one out of the equation uh, and know that we are ensuring the protection of the public? suggesting that from this I understand that 
going to have to be um, the police to not be involved at all. I was more referring to things like wellness checks um, or calls of, uh, you know, someone acting um, weird or things like public urination often is someone who either doesn't have somewhere to go or um, someone who might not be completely um, for lack of a better phrase, in their right mind. Um, things that don't present as violence, basically, um, is what I'm referring to. Oh, okay, fair enough, because that's not what I heard. When I heard you say um, not be present at all, I heard for all calls. And uh, we have to ensure that we don't put the public at risk either. And this is you know, part of the challenge in getting this right. I think this board is very committed to getting this right, but we want to make sure that we protect the public in so doing. So thank you very much, Erin, for being here today. Thank you very much, Erin. Um, okay, the next person on our list is Mitch Jackson. Mitch, are you available? There is no Mitch. Up. There is no, there is no Mitch. Okay, we'll move on to the next one, which is David Hennessy. David. Yeah. Thank you, uh, David. And I just I want to make clear that you know Karen classical model, and she absolutely did not 
recommend increased surveillance. That was not at all what she proposed. What she proposed was a redirection of resources uh, towards the upstream issues that led to crime. So very much what everybody has been saying today, social services, housing, addictions, uh, that what she did, what she did, what she pushed for, the creation of the hub model was to try to You, you Google her and you know she was about and Uh, city councilors and even the chief. Now we've we've left police to manage the symptoms pretty um, and given them pretty large budgets to do so. Ask ourselves why we're increasing um, the police budget instead of just directly funding sustainable solutions to these issues. Um, the police wouldn't need the money if the um, social issues themselves were being uh, directed and solved sustainably. Uh, the budget's roughly $358 million, increasing by $13 million, um, whereas public health, we're looking at about $74 million, and I think last year affordable housing got $15 million. Um, slightly off, but I think the general picture they paint uh, is really the point I'm trying to get across. Um, so I say, why give the police more money to essentially manage homeless when we could direct Policing is just not and the problem, of course, We've heard a lot of people that to say that I don't
thousand mental calls a year if 